I'm Tony Kennett, and joining me is Stephen Kent, the media director of the Consumer Choice Center and editor of GeekyStoics.com. So, Stephen, what you watching? Well, what am I not watching? I'll tell you what I'm not watching anymore is the problem with Jon Stewart on Apple TV. It's been about a month now since that show completely bit the dust on Apple. And I got to tell you, Tony, I'm I'm still just a little bit sad. Like, I never agreed with Jon Stewart necessarily sure. on the way that the world works, on politics. But he's sort of, you know, one of the leading comedians of our generation, particularly in the, the Bush years. And this guy comes back out of retirement in 2021, you know, returning somewhat gloriously to Apple TV, sort of as a rival now to his previous Padawan, John Oliver, who is you know, for all intents and purposes, crushing it on HBO. Mm -hmm. uh, and he completely falls flat. He has 180,000 homes watching his debut episode uh, when he first returns compared to John Oliver's 844,000 homes who watch his show. By episode five, there's only 40,000 people watching. Uh, but he was recently canceled and he will no longer have a second season. But it's not because of the ratings, Tony. It's actually much more sinister than that. Oh, okay. You got you to let me in on this one because those are some really rocky ratings. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this, is, this is the thing about the cancellation of the problem with Jon Stewart, which is that certainly there was a ratings problem. People weren't watching him. However, he's also John freaking Stewart. He has a little bit of clout, except for when he wants to do an episode dedicated in his second season of the show to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and you know the things that they do to run their country under their communist tyranny. He wanted to do one or two episodes focused on artificial intelligence and China. And Apple, being in business with China very deeply, having a very cozy relationship with China, they did not want him to do it. He wouldn't uh, desist. He wanted to do this episode. And so contract negotiations broke down about a month ago over the issue of covering China fairly and honestly. It's pretty shocking, actually, but it's a good testament to you have to have strong ratings in order to negotiate and do the kind of stuff that you want to do creatively. But it's also a sad state of affairs when Apple is running interference for China. Yeah, it's really interesting because usually you hear about this thing on the other side of the aisle. You know, you hear, you know, like, for example, Tucker and the whole mess with Fox News. But it's really weird to see um, kind of this contract negotiation breakdown situation occurring whenever you have a host or uh, someone say, look, I really want to report on this. I want to talk about this. I think this is what people want to hear. And due to kind of a third party, uh, the organization running, you know, your show cuts it dry. That's that's really weird. And given it's China, it's also got that spooky vibe as well. What else are you watching? Well, so here's the thing. I, I wrote an article in, in USA Today about the fall of Jon Stewart and just asking consumers, you know, is this the kind of entertainment ecosystem you want? One where right. China sort of calls balls and strikes. They get to decide what gets made and what doesn't. Uh, and how do consumers actually resist that? Because Chinese money has found its way into so many corners of Hollywood and the entertainment ecosystem. So right. what are you to do if China plays a role in practically every Disney production that gets made? Uh, you got to watch the movies that China cannot stand, that they have banned uh, in their own country and would like to see banned worldwide. And so in this article in USA Today, I lay out three movies that every American needs to seek out and watch right now, starting with Seven Years in Tibet on Netflix. This is a 1996 movie starring Brad Pitt, really in his prime, honestly, uh, playing a real life uh, man named Heinrich Harrer, who travels out of Europe during the start of World War II and gets to know the Dalai Lama right before the rise of uh, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party. And this movie is a brutal, brutal indictment of uh, the CCP's brutality, um, their evil, uh, and just their hatred of peace and freedom around the world. And it is no surprise that this movie is banned in China, but it is available on Netflix and it is highly worth watching. It's a sobering movie. Uh, but there's other movies that you could be watching too if you really want to stick it to the CCP. 
uh, as well as Red Corner starring Richard Gere. That's another 1997 movie that is streaming on Amazon where an American businessman is caught up in in an affair or dalliance in China and then has to go through the Chinese communist legal system and sees just how crooked it is. Uh, Mm. But Tony, I'm curious. There is one more movie that I wrote about here in this USA Today article uh, that is almost impossible to find and stream. And this is no no coincidence. Have you ever seen Kundun? I don't think I've ever actually seen Kundun, but I'm I'm perplexed. What mm-hmm. what what is this that no one's ever seen? I, that's one of those so, kind of monikers that's often applied but seldom yeah. upheld. Kundun. This is a this is a Martin Scorsese classic, a two a twenty eight million dollar production that Martin Scorsese did with Disney. Also in nineteen ninety seven. There's this Man, the weird of the nineties. Yeah, yeah. There's this very weird spat of anti China movies in the late nineties, right before uh, the real international rise of the CCP. Uh, but this movie is called Kundun, and it is again a movie focused on Tibet and the Dalai Lama and how the Chinese Communist Party moved to crush uh, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan people and their culture uh, in the post-World War II era. So we're talking kind of like the 50s and 60s. Um, It's a really, really sad story, uh, and it is the most scathing indictment of the CCP that exists, so much so that China moved to have this movie crushed when it came out in 1997. They got Disney to bury the movie. Disney ended up only releasing this movie in about three or four theaters in the United States. And they did this purely to appease the Chinese Communist Party. And Tony, you can't stream this movie anywhere today. Not on Disney Plus, not on Amazon, not on Netflix. So I'm not encouraging your listeners to go diving into the dark web necessarily. But this movie is out there and it's a movie that they don't want you to see. You know, if you're someone out there who knows of a, a banned movie that you cannot obtain any other place and you go to a <clears throat> sail the seven seas, as it were, that's certainly your own discretion. If you do choose to sail the seven seas and, you know, are <laughs> in that kind of a situation, make sure that you're using a VPN. The show is not sponsored by a VPN, but make sure that you're using a VPN. Um, so that said, I, I really want to hit on perhaps the moving forward. You talked about, uh, you know, watching movies that China doesn't want you to see. Um, I think that more so we need to name and identify Chinese influences and Chinese money in the American system. And I want to be clear, I don't mean, you know, Chinese American money, because this is usually where that conversation ends up going. Oh, you mean people that are descendants from China? No. No, I mean, Chinese national money coming into the United States and in education. We talk about this now in the Confucius Institutes. And, and the way that they're seeping into the education system. But there are so many facets of the, the tentacles from the Chinese monster in Disney and in Apple. And, and not only because so much of their production occurs there, but there are also so many Chinese funded ventures in media um, from news to entertainment. It's, it's wild. If we don't start isolating these groups, we can't separate ourselves from them because we won't know what they are. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And, you know, the the purpose of Chinese propaganda and, you know, putting a bunch of money into our system is I think the communists know something about American capitalists that is almost true in in a visceral and kind of dark way. I I believe uh, the old Marxist quote is that uh, the capitalist will sell us the rope that we'll use to hang them. Mm. Uh, And, you know, the general idea is that we just can't help ourselves when we see some money making opportunity. And the Chinese market is absolutely one such opportunity that every uh, entertainment and movie studio uh, in the United States has been tempted to try to tap into, but it's come at an incredible cost, so much so that we can't tell the stories about our own history, our own culture, and freedom around the world unless we get the seal of approval from Xi Jinping in China. And let me tell you, that seal of approval is never going to come. And it also comes on the heels of a kind of duality of of deciding what kind of culture gets to be talked about and what culture, you know, is not on the screen. Uh, and again, to, as things usually do, uh, I go back to, to Star Wars. And in the very last Star Wars movie, The Rise of Skywalker, which I abhor to the, the end of abhorrence, uh, at the very end, there's a there's a lesbian kiss at the end. Oh, they won and two old ladies give each other a big <laughs> smooch. And everyone in America.